Hello and welcome. Thank you for tuning in. This podcast is right for you if you don't want to be average, but rather want to look great, feel great and perform. All of the advice that you will hear in this podcast is delivered to you by my expert guests and by me, a holistic nutrition coach. This episode is special for me because my guest, Matt, besides being an amazing person, parent of two Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner, coach, Matt has been vegan for over 20 years and he's still kicking strong. So this is not the kind of person you come across very often, even in vegan communities. Anyway, during our open conversation, we discussed how Matt got into veganism at the age of 14, which has been very challenging at the time. What was the most challenging for him? What kind of challenges a typical active person can face on a vegan diet and how to overcome them? We also mentioned ketogenic diet and different dietary strategies. We mentioned excessive fiber and how too much can actually hurt your overall progress. And towards the end of the episode, we also talk about how Matt raises his kids who are not completely vegan. As always, you can find timestamps in the show notes so you can easily navigate through the podcast episode. We met pretty much online. I saw you writing in some posts that you have been on a vegan diet for like over 20 years and this is very rare with people that I mean, I don't know anybody personally or even online who has been on a vegan diet for over 20 years. So I was very curious. <laughs> so yeah, I have a lot of friends that have been over 20 years. Really? So what yeah. are you, some cultists or something like this? Some what? <laughs> like uh, fr from some cult or something like this, you know, like... Uh... Uh, not really a cult, but it definitely was uh, um, more of a movement from the 1990s that had to do with um, like hardcore music and uh, hardcore uh -huh. straight edge uh -huh. scene. So that's that's kind of how I got into veganism is, is from a few friends and there was this band called Earth Crisis from the early to mid 90s that sung a lot about veganism and animal rights and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so, so basically it was like uh, the question about ethics that got you into it. Yeah, yeah. It was all about ethics. <clears throat> they They actually had... You know, they had something called the new ethic where, you know, they thought that veganism was is was going to be the future. And they still think that they're all those band members are still vegan. And, uh, you know, I'm still vegan from back then. I went vegan when I was about 14 or 15 years old. And Whoa. I have, you know, Whoa. multiple friends that went around the same time or a little bit before I did. And, you know, they're I have some of them are in their 40s to mid 40s and they're still vegan and and they're they so, are alive <laughs> they're what they are still alive yep they're still alive and and thriving <laughs> i mean everybody has uh you know everybody has their issues with health and 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 wellness and everything and uh, what i've noticed is Because I grew, I have you know, I know a lot of people that are omnivores as well, and uh, you know, they kind of they had lots of health and wellness problems just as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it wasn't just if, different if you're a vegan or not. What was that? They just have some kind of different problems. Right. Everybody. So what I what I always tell people is is. Nutrition all comes down to chemistry, right? And so everybody kind of makes the same chemicals in our body. It's just different compositions and different ratios, different different enzymes maybe. And so we react to, to different foods differently, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's all I tell people. And, you know, I know a lot of people that were just vegan for a few years and it wasn't for them and And they didn't. They didn't thrive. 
being vegan and, and I, that's okay. Um, but you know, I think for a lots of the, for a multitude of people, I think they can, they can thrive very well on a vegan, um, belief system and a vegan diet. Oh, that sounds amazing. And, uh, funny that you mentioned that because just, So today I was listening to the podcast and it was not about veganism, it was about nutrition basically. And the lady presenting there was very well educated. I really loved what she mentioned there. And it was like, uh, just to paraphrase it, that a lot of evidence in nutrition uh, points into direction of plant-based diets, not like vegan, like 100%, but really based on plants and for different reasons like for nutrition that is like uh, phytonutrients and and you know antioxidants and especially fiber you know for gut macro sorry microbiome and right uh, so so these were like very important things to know then on the other side we have like people going carnivore nowadays <laughs> and keto and you know just doing the exact opposite things and what, what she was also saying was that uh, basically well of course you don't get fiber on this kind of diets are very very yeah. little and you are very limited regarding the good ba- bacteria in your gut but even if you decide to go like all plant-based for example you know for some people like you mentioned it's a uh, It works a little bit better for somebody. Some foods work a little bit worse. So it's kind of experimentation. And I think that some people uh, go into veganism or any other diet and they have an expectation that, okay, this, I will just follow this kind of paradigm and it will work for, for me. And they don't have the patience to experiment with even within vegan diet you know with certain different foods that might work with them or maybe more fat less carbohydrates you know this is like subjective things yes very much so yeah I, i've worked with people that you know tried to follow the 80 10 10 diet i don't know if you've ever heard of that one Yeah, sure. it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's eighty percent carbs, and I'm just like, eh, like, uh, and then they were wondering why they weren't really seeing the results that the that the diet, you know, were, was promising, and I'm just like, well, not everybody's body can handle that ma- that much carbohydrates, and you're going to retain a lot of water, right? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. On, on 80% carbs, that's like crazy. I don't even know, like, the highest amount of carbs I usually try to go is about, you know, 60% of my total calories, depending on my training regimen. But usually I get, I could get, eat a, a large amount of carbs and, and be okay. But my, um, my, uh, um, my respiratory quotient is a little bit different from a lot of people that I've tested their respiratory quotient. Are you familiar with the, the respiratory quotient? Oh, uh, yes, but not, not everybody who is listening might be familiar with the <laughs> yeah. term. So, <laughs> yeah. so what I mean by the respiratory quotient is just at any given time, how many fats you're burning into how many sugars or carbohydrates you're burning at a time and obviously since i eat a lot more carbs i'm utilizing a lot more carbs right so it's it's that simple like i mean i try to get a lot more you know healthy fats in my diet and stuff like that so i'm utilizing a little bit more fat for energy because it is a little bit more sustainable but um but uh you know sometimes uh i'm a little carb heavy and um It works for me, but with some nutrition clients that I work with, I have them, you know, sometimes as low as 25% of all their calories and sometimes even lower depending on if they're still having enough energy to complete their daily tasks and everything like that. So, <clears throat> Yeah, so basically it's a client, client first approach. It's great. Right, and- like... 
I have uh, I have one client I work with very closely, and we have her basically all the time on only 25% carbs, and she works very well on that. But she also was in a situation where she was very insulin resistance resistant, so like anything over that, she really held. You can tell that she held her fat in a certain area, which was not um, ideal. Mm -hmm. And what kind of goals did, uh, does she have? Uh, for her, she would just wanted to lose weight and get stronger, which, I mean, strength training is my expertise, so that part is, is easy. Um, but once we started using the, that macronutrient breakdown, I, within six weeks, I helped her lose 20 pounds. Um, so that was good. But, and, and that worked for her, but that's definitely not the approach I would take with everybody, for sure. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, what about you? Like you mentioned that you have, like, for example, different um, macronutrient split. Do you always track your macronutrients or is it like uh, just based on your specific goals, let's say in season, off season and so on? And yeah. when we are also mentioning that, let's put it into the context because uh, you are a trainer, right? You are an athlete. So what's your sport? Yeah, so I actually compete in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And um, so there's kind of not really an off season for me. <laughs> I kind of just whenever my competitions are, I usually have either a six week or 12 week camp. Um, and sometimes I don't even really have a camp. I'm just like, oh, this will be uh, a good benchmark for me to compete at this time. So I will. Um, so I try to eat actually, actually more intuitively. I don't really track my macros that much. I kind of go off how I feel, which um, took me a lot of years to get to that point. Yeah, I um, but yeah, I find yeah, it's yeah. a lot more sustainable. Like macro tracking macros is good short term, but for very very long term, uh, tracking macros can get kind of uh, monotonous. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and when you work with clients, how do you approach that? Do you usually have them track? from the beginning or do you um, work more on, a, on the intuitive side or some other way? I like to have them at least track it first because then it gives them a good basis of kind of how they should be eating. And then I have them start tracking less and less until they can eat a little bit more intuitively. Um, I find that's the best. And some people, they just like to track. Like it's, that's what's for the, that works for them. And that's the way they like to, to, um, um, you know, uh, track their stuff and they like it. And some people hate to track and it works for them. And so I just, I just, it's a client by client, um, approach. Everybody's going to be different and you kind of, you have to conform a little bit to what they want. You can't let them just tell you what they want to do. Overall, like you have to still guide them, um, but it it should be what's what's going to give them the best success for sure. And I, I notice because I work with vegans and omnivores, um, I don't I don't I'm not very I'm not I won't just work with people that are vegan. I've worked with a lot of both, and um, it's definitely a little bit different from vegans to omnivores, um, but essentially it is the same approach for like macronutrient breakdown, obviously with vegans, um, their, a lot of their protein sources are a little bit higher in carbohydrates, but really that's just adjustment in the macronutrients. Um, and it's not that big of a difference. Yeah. So you, you just made me realize one thing actually, as you were speaking about like, uh, that it depends regarding macro counting from client to client or from person to person and that some people naturally gravitate towards tracking everything because they have or they want to have this kind of sense of control while other people uh, go more intuitive and this is usually I find within women and you gave me an idea when you were speaking about this that actually we need to do or 
we benefit from doing the opposite of what is natural for us. So, for example, if I'm on the intuitive side, I want to just go, you know, intuitively, not tracking. I hate tracking. This kind of person, I believe, would benefit a lot from tracking for for a short time. And it's yes, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, so, like, um, I know you're a precision nutrition uh, um, person as well. So, like, some people, like, even though they haven't really gone through the level one or level two um, um, habits, habits. I, find, I find level three works for some people. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they might not be your prototypical level three client, but I find that the level three strategies works best for them. Yeah. And uh, basically for listeners to understand level one is uh, basically for the most people, what you need to do? You don't necessarily need to track uh, macros, calories, these kind of things, but you need to have the basic habits in shape, like, meal preparation, right. getting calories, yeah. and so on. Then, yeah. uh, yes, level two is a little bit more advanced, and level three is really like being very restrictive in terms of uh, your dietary choice, very clean eating, everything is planned, and uh, <laughs> yeah, to the point. But actually, yeah. this is what people do on a for example, keto diet and so on, and they really gravitate towards that because it gives them like very little choices. So I think it also has this psychological effect that, yeah, I don't have many choices, you know, I cannot eat any sugar or whatever. So this is what I track and limiting these options, like you said, works for them. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think I think people try to put veganism in this whole other category of being very unsustainable because of not getting certain enough of certain macronutrients or even uh, certain minerals or certain uh, micronutrients or whatever. Mm-hmm. But but I think it's just. Um, a matter of strategizing just like with any any eating plan or any diet you're on there it's going to take some effort to be able to get everything because if you think about the 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 quintessential omnivorous diet um there's still some strategy you have to do because not everybody's going to like the taste of every single food so they're still going to emit certain foods like certain omnivores don't like They don't like fish or they don't like tomatoes or they don't like um, certain vegetables. So they're not going to get the the macronutrients or the phytochemicals from certain things. So they're going to have to either um, supplement or do a different strategy to get those those, um, certain uh, macronutrients, micronutrients or uh, minerals or whatever. And so it's the same to me, it's the same thing being being uh, vegan. You just have to do different strategies to um, best suit your your needs for your goals and your um, and your well being. So, yeah, and I actually don't view it as restrictive as, for example, yeah, keto, for example, ketogenic diet, because still you can get so at least from perspective of macronutrients, you can get all of them, right? On a keto diet, you can't. Yeah, the macronutrients, yes. Um, I mean, it's a little bit lower. I mean, it's a lot lower on the carbohydrate macronutrient, but, you know, they're, that, the, the, they're still doing lots of research, and there has been a lot of research done that, you know, about ketosis in the body and how it works um, and, and how basically it turns the fats into carbohydrates or utilizes the fats as carbohydrates in your body as you digest it and everything like that. So, I mean, I think, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think the jury's out on that, on, on that, all that stuff yet, but I, I have seen people have success with the keto diet, but I'll have to say that it's more, on a short term basis that I've seen success because I've seen some athletes use it and their performance usually goes way down when they change to the ketogenic diet. 
I mean, yes, definitely. Uh, I haven't seen anything that would um, that would be beneficial for an athlete or an active person. No, because uh, I mean, carbohydrates are pretty normal, essential. That, that doesn't have like, sorry, that doesn't have like a medical condition or something like that that they would need to go on keto. Right. Um, I have seen very, very good success in like body composition goals with the keto diet. Yeah. Because it does change what we were talking about before that respiratory quote and to help you utilize more fats, obviously, because your fats, your, your diet's mostly made up of fat. So you're obviously using more fats. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And when we are speaking about macros and like you said, the protein choices on a vegan diet is very tied with carbohydrates like beans, legumes, they, they are rich in carbohydrates as well as, uh, as well as protein relatively. And they also have a lot of fiber. So how do you troubleshoot that? Do you have people or clients who want to get, let's say more protein, uh, to get these whole food sources or do you have them maybe preferentiate some maybe protein powders or processed foods like vegetable proteins texturized or something like that um yeah i i feel that out as well because i notice there are certain vegans that won't eat like the vegetable proteins or like the meat substitutes just mm-hmm. because they don't like the texture and they don't like that it looks like fake meat fake meat <laughs> So, um, I mean, I'll have people do, you know, beans, lentils, uh, I find seitan and, uh, tempeh are very good sources of protein, but I also let people know that, um, we don't actually need as much protein as a lot of people think we do, or as much as, uh, you know, like, especially the United States, we're very protein heavy here. Um, we really push protein, protein, protein. And as I think we do need, you know, uh, at least a minimum amount. And if we're different kinds of athletes need different volumes of protein, um, I think that um, usually I think it's more about just getting good amino acid profiles and um, getting within a good protein range. So I definitely go more towards the whole foods first, and then I have them supplement if they're not reaching, uh, you know, their minimum protein goals. At least I'll have them supplement with some good um, plant protein powders or even some um, protein bars that are, I try to go more towards the whole foods kind of protein bars uh, instead of the super processed ones, which there's a protein bar I really like called Go Macro from the United States ran by a a mother and daughter, and um, I've been I've been doing uh, their protein bars quite a bit because they're super, they're minimally processed. So I like to go with those. But yeah, and, and you know some and and uh, some people um, like a lot of those fake meats. I personally eat uh, some of the fake meats. I try not to overdo it, and I try to not really overdo the soy. Even though there is a lot of myths about the soy, I think people can just... I don't like to overdo anything, really. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, so, like, I, won't, I don't drink, like, soy milk. I'll tend more towards, like, the pea milks, the almond milks. And then even when I'm eating the fake meats, I like to go more towards, um, like, a, a wheat meat or, like, a, or other alternatives. But um, like I do get, What's that? Yeah, like, seitan is a good one. Um, just all, you know, other, other alternatives, but I do still eat some soy. I haven't really noticed a lot of adverse effects from soy and I have, I ate a lot of it, the, especially the first 10 years I was vegan and I haven't really noticed a lot of, uh, negative effects from it at all. So, um, I, I don't feel like my estrogen levels really went up that much <laughs> or anything like that, because really, and if people are worried about that, because uh, I know a lot of people are, there's a chemical in broccoli and cauliflower and that family of vegetables that actually combat the phytoestrogens from soy. That's why usually if I am eating a soy, I'll eat um, one of those type of vegetables with it. Oh, I haven't heard about this. 
Yeah, that's uh, it's a really good strategy. If you're thinking that you're getting a little bit too many phytoestrogens in your diet, just make sure you're eating them with uh, broccoli or cauliflower or something in that family of vegetables. Yeah, so cruciferous vegetables, right? Yeah, yes. Huh? That's funny because uh, that's actually what I've been doing intuitively. I mean, I love broccoli and also like kale and so on. So I usually have broccoli together with soy or, or I mean soy products. That's one thing. Yeah. But I, I'm on the opposite side. Like I I like Satan, but it doesn't sit in my stomach well. Right. I mean, I had it like a few days ago and um, in larger amount that I can digest probably. Mm. And uh, yeah, I could feel that, which doesn't really happen with texturized vegetable proteins. Uh-huh. And yeah, I really love, um, now what is it? Uh, tempeh, tempeh, natto, you know, these f- like fermented sources of soy. I, I really right. love them. Yeah. And there's, the, you know, there's all sorts of different strategies. And like you said, you got to. F- you got to take into account how you feel after you eat a meal. If you feel bloated and heavy, that probably wasn't the best meal for you. And you can find different strategies. Like um, some people don't really react well to quinoa. So, you know, maybe like uh, brown rice or a couscous or some other sort of complex carbohydrate might be better for them. I like yeah, quinoa yeah. because it's a complete protein by itself. So, um It's a good one to have. I usually, you know, I usually have some sort of vegetable with it and I do add a little bit more protein with it, some sort of vegetable protein or um, mock meat with it. Like last night for dinner, I had quinoa, some uh, mandarin chicken, uh, mandarin soy chicken, and uh, Mm -hmm. I had some peas and some broccoli. And, you know, that's a pretty complete meal right there. Um, I cooked the meat in avocado oil, which is a good fat. <clears throat> and then uh, throughout the day, you know, I ate a lot of um, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. Uh, I made an awesome smoothie with chia seeds in it. So, I mean, there's just different strategies you can make. There's awesome, like, there's some go-to recipes that I just use a lot that, like, might be a simple shake for me like in the middle of the day to get extra calories. Because um, if there is any challenges to a vegan diet, especially as being an athlete, it might be your calorie intake. And so sometimes um, that can be a little bit of a challenge is getting enough calories without getting too yeah, much yeah. fiber and stuff like that. <laughs> that's, that's definitely something that I've noticed <laughs> myself. <laughs> And like it's a constant fight for me in that regards, but it comes down to the basic habits of you know like eating before eating having a shake before a workout or something like this, which I have been including recently, and I feel better. Yeah. And yeah, I mean because why I'm saying this is because there are some people who say like you know I went vegan and my digestion got much worse and blah 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 so you know things along these lines i mean of course my digestion also went worse at certain points certain times but it was because of my stupidity (laughs) i'm not saying that these people are stupid it's just that uh, i did stupid things like uh, you know doing like two meals a day and i mean come on on a vegan diet two meals a day even (laughs) if i'm covering all the calories i mean it's not optimal strategy to, to have two huge meals. Yeah, your your digestion, you just, your your body doesn't want to digest that much food at one time. Yeah, definitely. So for me, it, it's really you know I'm a small frame person. So for me, splitting into like four to five meals works much much better. Right, and and or like. Doing something that I feel like was, you know, I like something like brand, like like say like Raisin Bran cereal. I don't know if you're familiar with mm-hmm. that, but I love that cereal, but I can't eat it because I already get enough fiber in my diet. And so if I eat that, it just already, it puts me way over on my fiber goals <laughs> and um, it doesn't make me have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are your fiber goals? 
it just depends. Like, um, you know, around around 60 grams of, of fiber a day is 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 pretty pretty normal. Um, a lot of times, I don't really need to track it. I just will know. Okay, if I eat too much too much fruit this day, or if I eat too many strawberries, or if I eat, you know. It's, you know, too too much of something that I'll that I'll be overdoing it, but um, it, it definitely you need. It's good to have a certain amount of fiber per you know like per gram of carbohydrate and everything like that. So I try to follow those guidelines a little bit, but I'm not too particular into following any any number super course closely. I, like I said, I'm more of an intuitive eater, so. Um, and I, I do try to, to, um, eat a certain amount of calories before and after a workout, depending on when I work out. If I'm doing a training session in the morning, sometimes I'll do it on, uh, in a fasted state and I feel really good. So, um, but then sometimes I'll work out in a fasted state and it didn't go and it doesn't go so well. So I just play around with that and try to go more off of how I feel than anything. Um, but like we've talked about before, that isn't for everybody. <laughs> yeah, de definitely. Like my view, uh, or l let me tell you my background, it was like one year I spent tracking everything. So I, well, like we mentioned uh, earlier, I got pretty good estimation of like which foods have how many calories and so on because in the end i'm eating pretty much the same foods all over the all, all the time again and again so it's not like uh putting into my diet something that would be drastically different or something you know like even even with fruits or um, legumes or um, grains, they have similar calorie contents, similar composition regarding macronutrients. So y you can, even without consciously counting it, you know, you can make these choices, right? It's like educated mm. guess. Right. Mm. So Yeah, for sure. And uh, like you were saying regarding the, the fiber content, Actually, what I really loved, uh, do you know Nancy Clark? She's a sports dietitian. Yeah, I, I follow her, actually. Oh, she's amazing. Yeah. And uh, recently I was reading a post from her, or blog post, and um, it was regarding this kind of mindset that we have, or some people like me had, and it was like, you know, going all whole foods and, for example, eating brown rice in, instead of white rice. And what is the place of like more processed foods in an athlete's uh, food intake? And yes, as an athlete, you, for example, you get these 50 grams of fiber, let's say, and all the nutrients like micronutrients from the fruits and so on. So, I mean, why, why would you push and eat salad on top of that still, you know, like when you <laughs> don't really need to uh, carry your micronutrients needs. And this is especially true for people like uh, who are vegan or on a plant-based diet, who have a lot of fiber, a lot of micronutrition, but, you know, then still pushing uh, these very nutritious but caloric diluted foods uh, instead of getting more calories <laughs> right right yeah i mean it's good to have you you do want to cover your basis on everything but like as an athlete if without those calories you're just not going to be able to perform and that's like yeah. and like at one time when i was training in mma i trained in mma years ago and the minimum amount of calories that i was supposed to be eating was like four thousand calories a day which was a lot for me. And I maybe averaged 2,500 to 3,000. And I could fill it in my training sessions. I was uh, lethargic a, a lot of times. I couldn't keep up with the other athletes. And so I had to do a, a, you know, a lot of different strategies to try to get my calorie intakes intake during the day. Um, and, so, and so just eating another salad 
wouldn't help me. So if I did eat another salad, it would I would put everything under the sun in it. You know, all the seeds, beans, avocado, like anything that I knew that was more cal- calorically dense, I would put in the salad. So, um, yeah. So sometimes that could that that was a challenge. It was it was eating all those calories. Um, but saying that, I don't know if you've um, ever read the book, the thrive diet, mm-hmm. which I think we, I think some of us have talked about in the precision nutrition group. Um, he talks about eating certain things that you can utilize the energy from those things uh, a lot better or a lot more efficiently. So I would say that if you're a little bit more plant-based or the plant-based, I think a lot of times, the calories from those things can be utilized you know, a lot more efficiently than say from like uh, like a red meat source because just the cost of digestion and everything. Well, I actually have the opposite opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I mean, red meat, yes, that, that's one thing. But for example, you know, we have like fish, eggs. Uh-huh. These seem to be very well absorbed. Uh-huh. So... This this can be really beneficial for people, like in general. Uh-huh. And I completely agree with what you just said, or what Brandon in the book says that um, yeah, there are certain foods, but I don't think it's only about foods. It's about also our ability to digest right. certain foods, and this, regardless of the food or the food group. Uh, can vary from like time to time, even within the day. So, for example, if you are very stressed after the training or from the job or whatever, your digestion will be shit and uh, you can have like pre-digested fermented protein powder. You will not be able to utilize it because of the stress. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And then there's like, uh, like a good example is... You know, certain people from certain ethnic backgrounds have different enzymes um, that, you know, some people can digest uh, dairy very well or lactic acid and some ethnic backgrounds don't digest it nearly as well because of different enzymes they make in their body. Yeah, definitely. So this is something that people can track. And I would say that if you eat, for example, diary, then like aged cheese uh, cheeses or diary it's like much much better i would say right i don't know i mean as long as as long as they don't have a full allergic um definitely i mean a full allergy to dairy they're fine so um but yeah everybody's going to be a little bit different everybody like like i like i said before everybody has different levels of the different chemicals in their body that help them um, help them process the foods in their body in different ways. So, um, and that's where people have to kind of play around with what they eat and see what's going to be best for them. Um, and not, I mean, it's okay to try different, like, I guess diets. I'm not a really big fad diet person and I'll, uh, some people would try to, try to argue that veganism is a fad diet, but I'll always argue that it's not, it's not in fact a diet at all. <laughs> mm. uh, there is the diet aspect to the, the, to, to veganism in general, but um, um, I'll, I'll usually tell them that they're more talking about plant-based and then it's a whole different conversation because plant-based isn't refraining from wearing leather and wearing wool and, and not using animal tested oh. products, you know, that's veganism. Plant based is just, you know, being eating more plants or, you know, being a little bit more of a strict vegetarian, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, have you been like uh, all these years, like for 20 years, strict with your diet? Yes, or- I've been pretty strict. Yeah. I've been, when I was younger, my parents wouldn't cook for me anymore because. I wouldn't, I grew up in a meat and potatoes family and, and they wouldn't cook for me anymore. So I had to start 
um, cooking for myself, and there was a lot of experimentation there, especially on a when you're a 15 year old kid and your budget's basically nothing. <laughs> there was a lot of weird concoctions I would make uh, that I probably would never repeat as as uh, as an adult. <laughs> Wow. So did you have to buy food that you would cook for yourself? Yeah. So, I mean, there was six months, um, straight six months one time that I lived off just rice and soy sauce because that was all I had access to at the time. Wow. And, uh, I mean, it's not like I felt the best, but, I mean, I was 16, 17 years old at the time, so... You know, that was kind of secondary to, like, my beliefs w was was my health, you know what I mean? Like, I was still active. I, I skateboarded. I played basketball, football, all sorts of different things. Went to hardcore shows. Um, and, I, you know, I didn't have any less energy than any of my peers. So, <laughs> uh -huh. um, right, you know, and they would always say, you know, like, I would do something – uh, I would do something good in like a like a basketball game. You know, I'd score a point, or in football, I'd tackle somebody, and uh, they'd be, "Oh, that was good for a vegan." <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, "Oh, okay, whatever." <laughs> yeah, definitely. And uh, how was then? Uh, how did this evolve, like within the family? Because of course, you like mentioned, your parents were probably not very happy with you going on that kind of diet and you know like for example a lot of teenagers nowadays who want to go on vegan diet like what would you advise them to do yeah well nowadays it's so much easier they have there's so much more education about it nowadays it is we are in the information age now so mm -hmm. now you just have to sift through the bullshit right yeah, <laughs> so, yeah exactly <laughs> that is the biggest problem now And so it's it's kind of hard to see what's propaganda and what's actual advice to try to help you. But I just I would the, the advice I would give is is just educate yourself as much as possible, especially on nutrition. I mean, that's how I got into nutrition initially was to try to not only help myself excel in 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 wellness, but educate other people as well. So nowadays, like when, when I was young, for example, there was much thing as, as silk or like soy, really a, like a lot of the soy milks or fake meats or anything. Uh, the only really milk I had was rice milk and it was basically just like sugar water. It was gross. I, I, I was yeah, like, it's, I'd it's almost rather put imagine. water on my cereal. <laughs> <laughs> But nowadays it's like, it's such an open thing. Like when I first went vegan, nobody really knew. A lot of people still didn't know what it was. So if I went in, and said, oh, hey, do you have any vegan options? They'd look at me like I had lobsters crawling out of my ears. <laughs> they'd, they'd be like, what's that? Like, we have no clue. Especially growing up in, in Utah, which there's a lot of rural parts of Utah where they have um, dairy farms and mink farms mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, Salt Lake City that I live in is a pretty big city, but they're still on the outskirts. There's still a lot of farming area and stuff like that. But um, uh, So... So, yeah, the beginnings were quite rough because a lot of people didn't know what it was. But nowadays, it's, you know, everybody knows what it is. And there's so many different um, options and different resources for you nowadays that it's it's not hard. It's just a matter of wanting to do it. If you don't want to do it, then it might seem kind of hard. But if you really want to do it, it's not going to seem very hard at all. Yeah, definitely. And what do you suppose is the thing that gave you the biggest issues like on a vegan diet uh, like, what do you see with with your clients for example like what's the biggest issue i see with my clients with the vegan with the vegan diet yes yourself or the vegans oh or, or like i clients. said i think the biggest thing really is um just the calorie intake uh, i usually have to well really calories in general i usually have to up on But almost every client I've ever worked with because they usually are under eating um, which is quite a new revelation because people always think oh people are overeating which I mean there are definitely some people that overeat but for their activity level and everything and the goals they want to hit people are usually under eating um, 
So, but that's usually a big thing. And then sometimes they don't. Like I find I, you know, sometimes I'll just take like a multivitamin or like they, people will talk about um, covering like the B12 and um, B12 is a big one. Uh, certain other ones like um, zinc and iron and uh, and even protein. Protein's getting a less of an issue uh, as it used to because people are a little more educated about protein and amino acid profile and everything nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, I mean, those things are easy to get too. I mean, B12 you can get from um, nutritional yeast, other fortified things. I mean, you, you basically can't get it natural because it just comes from liver, right? You can't really get a natural source of B12 unless it's come from an animal liver, right? So, <laughs> something bacteria? Yeah. Right. It's in the bacteria in their stomach, and that's what produces B12, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, and it does. So, we do produce B12 as well. Like, it's definitely like, it doesn't just get, it doesn't get pushed out as much as the other B vitamins because even though they are water soluble, B12 does stay in our um, system a little bit longer than the other B vitamins. Um, and then, like, with iron and certain things, I mean, you just have to get a right mixture of, of them, right? Like, I mean, vitamin D and calcium is a good example where they kind of work together, right? They're like cofactors, basically. Yeah. Uh, same with, like, vitamin C. Like, vitamin C enhances, like, basically every other vitamin. <clears throat> and iron, I, Especially yeah, and iron's a big issue for some. I have one vegan client, and she was anemic. And so I had to give her a lot of strategies to up her iron intake, um, like cooking with an iron pan, uh, making sure she's, you know, eating like getting a little bit more vitamin C with, with things um, and, mm -hmm. and eating things with a little bit more iron that had, because it's hard to get, you know, there's the hemi and non-hemi sources. And obviously she doesn't eat the hemi sources because hemi sources only come from animal protein, right? So, you know, she has to probably get a little bit, a little bit more because the non-hemi doesn't absorb as well as the hemi. Um, but I mean, as long as she's taking those strategies, she's usually a little bit more full of energy and stuff like that. So, <clears throat> but yeah, so it's it's everybody's gonna be a little bit different, like so. Yeah, and I think the important point to mention is also that the. Uh, nutrition as it is is not static i mean it evolves so at least how i understand it so for example what works for you today might not work for you tomorrow right it's a lot i mean it's science right and science is ever evolving yeah also <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's ever evolving so like if you're a big believer in science like i am like there could be an awesome study with good peer reviews and everything that could change your opinion on something, right? It's, it's, it's like a lot of what Precision Nutrition talks about is being nutritionally agnostic, right? Like even though I'm vegan, that's more of an ethical choice, but in my nutritional choices, in my nutritional beliefs, I'm very agnostic because I believe... You know, every it's going to be everything's uh, a case by case basis. You know, I'm not just going to give everyone some cookie cutter um, nutrition plan because it's not going to work for everybody. Definitely, and I'm really happy to hear that because you know there are still, I think, a lot of vegans who simply see, for example, any any more source like. Animal source of protein automatically gives you cancer or you know, anything <laughs> right. like that. So, uh, right, and, and and that's kind of sad because you know some people just don't have the same beliefs, and that's fine. Like some of my best friends in the world have way different beliefs than me, and it doesn't mean I'm going to push my my beliefs or agenda on them at all, and, and it doesn't make them a bad person for having different beliefs than me. <laughs> and I think that actually your approach that you have like being agnostic and not pushing beliefs is um, or can be very motivational and inspirational also for people and probably you don't also 
go around and say to everybody you, you are vegan or something like that. You know. <laughs> yeah, usually people are pretty surprised when they find out. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I mean. It's probably that you are, you know, like you are doing your job, like doing jiu-jitsu or whatever, you are energetic and people ask you like, hey Matt, what are you doing? How can I have energy like you? And like, what are you eating to have this kind of energy? And you tell them that you are vegan and then they are surprised. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times, a lot of times I won't have somebody find out till we go out to eat together and they're like, oh, why don't you get this? Why don't you yeah. get that? And then I'll tell them, and they're like, oh my gosh, I would have never guessed. <laughs> So, so what what, uh, <clears throat> what do you think also about this like um, lab grown meat like um, meat that is being made in a, well not, not in factory but like in laboratories from some stem cells or something like that. Yeah, I've seen that, and I'll, I'll be totally honest. I kind of don't know how to feel about it yet. <laughs> I'm still kind of like processing that information because it's very, it's a very new thing. And, you know, veganism is about, you know, trying to, to abolish like the suffering of animals and everything. And so if an animal isn't really suffering and, and it was never actually alive, right. Is what I'm gathering. It yeah, never had. It's, it's just it's just tissue. right. It's just tissue. It never had an essential nervous system. It never had, um, you know, it never had a a, a prefrontal cortex or anything like that. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, I'm I'm I don't know if I could push myself to eat it, just because I just haven't ate any kind of meat in so long. But ethically wise, I think it's it's um, going on the better track, getting away from factory farming and, and all the torture and everything that happens in that setting. So whatever steps to, to minimize that other stuff is always good to me. But uh, I'll have to be honest that I, I kind of just don't know how to feel about it yet because it's, it's very like science fiction futuristic to me. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And like from nutritional perspective, what I think is that, well, I, I've been speaking with few people about this, like how they feel about it. And especially like uh, vegans are like, no, it's still meat and you know, why and so on. Uh, why would I eat it? Like you mentioned, for example, you wouldn't eat that, eat that because, well, first and foremost, you don't crave that, and yeah, like what for? Um, right. On the other hand, people who are like who who eat meat, like are let's call the omnivores uh, yeah. or normal people, or however we want to label them, then they have restriction to eat it because, you know, it's like GMO food and so on. So it's lab grown, so it's automatically bad and so on. So I don't really see it in the near future to be like successful in that regards. Right. I, I don't really think so either because I think it's going to be kind of devoid of, of some of the essential makeup uh, that makes an animal protein because of the processes of the things that go through like the animal's bloodstream to make the meat um, have the nutrients that it does in the first place uh, is one thing I think about. Um, I don't know how they would copy that exactly. I mean, I think they'll definitely try to, I, th I think it will definitely have um, the complete protein you know, amino, uh, uh, amino um, acid profile, but I definitely, it will, it will be like any other, like, super processed um, food out there. So, but then again, like, I remember oh, I had yeah. this exercise physiology teacher, yeah. and he was drinking um, a Diet Coke, 
And everybody was like, oh, how can you drink that? How can you put it in your body? And he was like, you know, basically most things I put in my body turn into to glycogen. <laughs> so he's like, if it's processed or not, it kind of turns into the same thing into our bodies. Um, that was just one point of view from a professor I had. And it was kind of a kind of a neat point of view because he was like, GMO, whatever you're putting in your body, it kind of turns into the same thing. Uh, well, yes and no, right? Like now we are uh, seeing that it has effects on the, actually the, mac mm, sorry, <laughs> microbiome in our body. So. You're right, right. And, and that's still that's still being studied a lot is the microbiome, right? The, the second brain, which I actually was is i think uh people are very undereducated about the microbiome because it's so important to your immune system and everything <clears throat> well yeah it's connected to everything like just <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is the microbiome is us more than we are us <laughs> yeah i would say yeah and if you, you can if you have an optimal you know, if your microbiome biome is good, then, you know, usually you'll feel great and, and, and everything will be good. But um, <laughs> that people are still being that that's a very undereducated part, even of the nutrition um, aspect. And that, um, that was a big part that I took away from the, the precision nutrition course was that 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 section, especially about the microbiome. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, it's very so, interesting topic. Um, I will for sure have like guests on this topic in the future. Yeah. So I would like to, I would like to hear something on on uh, a whole show about that. That would be good. <laughs> well, I can hook you up with some because uh, I mean I have uh, several of these podcasts and that go like two three hours speaking about microbiome uh -huh. and it's like very <laughs> it's it's mind blowing. Like, That's awesome. from, for example, I was listening to one last Sunday and uh, there was there was a guy, I don't remember his name, but he was explaining this doctor uh, how, how we are killing ourselves by consuming foods that are basically grown like GMOs, but mm -hmm. not directly because of, it is like genetically modified, but... Uh, the reason they are genetically modified is so they can spray them more with this glyphosate and other herbicides and pesticides. And right. uh, basically, uh, to be able to spray that, it cannot be harmful to, to a person, to humans. And, and it has been proven that it, it has no direct effect on us, but it actually kills our microbiome. So... It is killing us indirectly, <laughs> and the, right. the whole point was that actually, you know, then it starts to attack in our gut, and mm -hmm. uh, there you get irritable irritable bowel syndrome and so on. So because basically that you are getting all these particles and undigested food and everything to the bloodstream where it should not be. Because now, mm -hmm. now you have like, yeah, um, <clears throat> your guts are not working as they should. And mm -hmm. then you're basically, um, now I'm just really paraphrasing, uh, attacks your cells and what happens with the cell that is damaged? It just kills itself, right? It sends a signal right. and mm -hmm. it is cleared. Right, so we regenerate basically in that way, but um, the signaling when when this is not working good, well as it's supposed to work, uh, the cell stops sending this signal or cannot send it over, so it stays as a damaged cell, and these damaged cells accumulate, and this is how different like illnesses also cancer develop in our bodies so it's like a very long let's say process very indirect but it's a really a chain reaction right so this was really amazing. yeah yeah that stuff uh, um 
I'm still getting a lot more into that stuff, but yeah, that's very, that's very interesting for sure. Yeah, and th this was not like a definitive thing. It, it was more of a kind of hypothesis or opinion of this person, but uh -huh. I mean, it made a kind of logical sense, right? So let's see what right. we can do about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> It all comes down to, you know, the big, um, the big, uh, uh, what, what was I thinking about? So everyone, it all comes down to the, the easiest, fastest way you can make um, money and get the product to the masses, right? Like, mm -hmm. we don't really care how they do it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so one more question that I have for you is like oh, what does your basically like daily meal plan looks like like do you pre maybe you just mentioned like you prioritize beans legumes maybe grains maybe fruits what's your favorite food um so you know sometimes I never meal prep, like I said, like I eat everything pretty in intuitively. I kind of just like when I make meals, I just make sure I have a good protein, good carbohydrate, good fat, and then usually have a good green with that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my favorite food, uh, I'm such a, uh, I eat so many different kinds of foods. Um, really, my favorite foods are our uh, Indian food, uh, uh, Thai food. I love Thai food. Um, I love Mexican food. <laughs> um, I basically, you can basically make a, a complete, complete uh, meal out of, uh, out of a burrito. So burritos are a good staple for dinner because you could switch up what's in them all the time. Um, good big fat salads. Um, Uh, I have, if I'm going for a little bit more calories on a day, I know I'm going to be training. I have a good thousand calorie shake recipe I use. That's very simple. It just has, um, chocolate almond milk, uh, a bunch of, uh, nut butter in it, uh, some chia seeds, flax seeds, banana, and maybe once in a while I'll put a protein powder in there. Um, lately I've actually been experimenting with beetroot powder. And I've actually been feeling the effects on my aerobic training, which I've liked. Um, and I also do take creatine most of the time. And I find that helps me with my, um, my more intense training. Because on a, on a vegan diet, you don't really get any creatine outside the, what you make in your own body. So you make about one gram of, of creatine in your body a, a day. Um, and usually people only get about one gram extra if they're eating like animal proteins or stuff like that. And so I usually take about five grams of creatine monohydrate um, every day too. I mean, I have to drink a little bit more water, but um, you know, I try to get, I try to stay hydrated quite well. Um, I mean, I have kids and they can be picky, so smoothies are a go to them. I'll hide, I'll hide the greens in there for the kids. Are they um, also vegan? <laughs> uh, they are not because their mom is not vegan, um, but they are um, vegetarian. So they've never tried um, animal protein before. But so, like, um, they eat uh, like dairy or, or lacto vegetarian or what kind? Yeah, they're they're lacto vegetarian, so yeah, they'll eat dairy and some things. Like my son, he's about eight years old, and he'll he'll say, you know, Dad, I like the kind with cow's milk in it. I don't like, or I like I don't like the kind with cow's milk in it. Like so, he's kind of funny that he knows the difference. Like he'll like certain ice cream flavors with cow's milk and other flavors um, of of the vegan kind. So. <laughs> it's kind of funny <laughs> I don't. I try not to push my beliefs if they ask my opinions on things I'll give them my opinions and I'll give them things to research but I won't tell them I won't tell them what to do <laughs> how, how does it look like with the 80 year olds like how do they research <laughs> they're, they're a lot smarter than, than people think usually 
but um, it's quite funny because uh, he'll just ask about something and then I'll give him my opinion and he'll be like, oh, okay, that makes sense, Dad. Uh-huh. Um, and some things I'll have to explain, you know, as, as simple as possible. <laughs> That's a good practice um, for coaching. Oh, it is. It's it's great. <laughs> and sometimes I can be even more intricate with him than I can some of my clients. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but sometimes he'll get in even arguments at school about type of that type of stuff because we are in a very religious state mm-hmm. um, and they believe in a certain thing. So like, you know, I'll have him watch like the cosmos with me or something. And he goes to school and somebody will talk about something religious and he'll be like, what are you talking about? The big bang. And he'll say the big bang theory made the universe. And they'll be like, no, God made the universe. And I'm like, you're in second grade. Dude, you don't need to be talking about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so yeah, I try to educate him as much as possible. Um, but I find at this age, like I don't try to keep him too strict to anything. I try to make him let him make his, some of his own choices, um and that can only happen to a point because he is only almost eight years old like he he needs guidance of course um you can't just be like oh yeah go run in the street against traffic yeah that's fine if that's what you want to do you know you have to give him some guidance like hey that's not a very good idea you'll get hit by a car (laughs) but so yeah it can be a little bit because then he'll he will ask about like hey like how did they make this cheese and I'll tell him, he'll be like, oh, dad, I won't. Eat. And then he won't eat cheese for like a month and he'll forget about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's like uh, uh, very good to have uh, kids get in touch with the food production, like how it is produced and so on. Because also like we as adults uh, lost the connection especially when we live in cities you know you go to supermarket and you buy something that is in package and you don't differentiate between uh you know grass-fed beef normal beef milk almond milk soy milk or you know soybean or whatever it's it's all one thing for you yeah yeah it's good it's good to educate as much as possible Because they don't, yeah, you never see it's all just packaged up. Looks like a nice little pretty package of whatever you want. And it's it's always accessible. And if they run out at the store, it's a national crisis. (laughs) Yeah, the worst thing possible. (laughs) Oh, my gosh, Dad, they don't have cow's milk um, mint chocolate chip ice cream. Oh, no. (laughs) You'll be fine without it, son, I swear. (laughs) Yeah, make your own. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so um like i said I, I try to i try to switch it up as much as possible um in the meals i make but i do try to hit those points um and i do take i also do take a food-based multivitamin um mm-hmm. it doesn't hurt because i mean most of it's water soluble so i pee a lot of it out anyway <laughs> um and you know i've it's worked for me over the years to how I eat. And, um, and if I feel something lagging, I'll add something. And if I feel something <laughs> that's weighing me down or anything, I'll subtract something. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I, I you know, know, but I know that <laughs> for many people, especially who are new so, to like yeah. fitness or doing, uh, understanding the food and nutrition, it can be very, vague term you know like add something and so on and going by the feeling yeah. it's like very very uh, unproductive <laughs> it's, it's right it can be challenging so like i've wrote like in-depth meal plans for people and they like it but then sometimes it gets a little monotonous and i'm like well see that um vegetable you had you could just switch up the vegetable or see that protein source you have you could just switch up the protein so i'll be like just follow these this this you know i made you a four-week meal plan with different meals different everything to meet your macronutrients need if you get sick of something just sub it out for something that's going to be of the same category then i mean usually i'll make them a list of everything that's in you know the you know protein category carb uh category fat category 
so they can kind of mix and match what they like. And, you know, and, you know, I'm not a right. big fan of making detailed meal plans because it is a lot of work. <laughs> and usually it's not that sustainable with the client because they're like, oh, well, I got this meal plan. I don't really need your help all that much well, <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I have my thing against meal plans, but it's like... I should start doing. Uh, yeah, I don't make them much, very much anymore. Usually, I'll do the, um, I'll do sample meal plans just to give right. them an idea, and then I'll just, like I said, I'll make lists of the categories of things, and I'll just be like, okay, mm -hmm. here's, here's like a complete meal. Get something from each category, exactly. and you're usually good to go. That's what I really love to do. As and well. then I'm gonna have, I'll have them track like on my fitness pal or something. And I usually the number one thing I see is is everybody doesn't like nobody ever gets enough greens. So I usually have to give them like a challenge, like eat a green with every meal, mm -hmm. uh, just to give just to get them like in the habit of eating. So, like because they have like zero greens in their whole food diary. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you need some greens. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, like, uh, just make your plate as colorful as possible, you know. And then you, we have resources to, you know, your red, your reds, your purples, you know, all that stuff. Definitely. Um, <laughs> like, but yeah. So. Like, I had a person, for example, ask me, like, how, how do I make a salad? I mean, like, I, I was looking at them, like, you know, me as a vegan, we eat salads a lot. It's like what do you mean how do you how you make a salad i mean you put vegetables together what, what, what what's the science behind it i mean <laughs> but yes it's yeah have a good protein on there good fats and so and really your good carbohydrates are already in there with your salad yeah i mean we can but make it not, as complicated like. as we want but the basic salad you know just mix some greens and use maybe some lemon juice or apple cider vinegar or vinegar or you know a little bit of salt pepper to your taste and i mean simple <laughs> yeah so, yeah you, yeah you can definitely make them a lot more complex with a lot more you know good fats and protein and everything but definitely so what, what kind of people do you work with and how can how can they reach I, you i work with a myriad of type of people i work with everybody from just kind of what would be called, I guess, your weekend warriors, um, just like your professional people, um, like say like pharmacists or doctors or um, accountants or whatever they're doing, you know. Um, and I work with also athletes. I work with grappling athletes, uh, contact sport athletes. I've worked, I've worked with um, winter sport athletes, uh, volleyball, soccer, um, football, uh, men, women. I've worked with youths, uh, elderly. I've worked with a, I've been doing this for a little over 10 years. So I've worked with a, a lot of different kind of people. Um, and then how they can get a hold of me, uh, best is like through my Instagram, which is at Matt Stedman SNC, mm -hmm. or they can find me on Facebook, at, um, at Matt Stedman. I don't really have a website. Um, I notice I usually do most of my correspondence through Instagram or Facebook. So um, that works quite well. And then if I go further with a client through there, I usually just use text or email. Yeah, so. definitely. Okay, Matt, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I really loved our discussion today. And yeah, it was awesome. No thank problem. you. Thank you, Daniel.
And that's it for today's episode. If you liked it, like it, share it, and you can also subscribe to my newsletter so you can get podcast episodes ahead of everyone else. Besides that, each week I share videos, articles, podcasts and thoughts that I found beneficial during the week. You will also get access to my closed Facebook group of like-minded people who want to optimize their health, life and performance. And if you want to make your life easier and reach your body and performance goals faster, you will definitely be a benefit. And if you want to make your life easier and reach your goals, body goals and performance goals faster, you will definitely benefit from my one-on-one personalized coaching. Just send me an email to daniel at danweiss.eu or go directly through the website and we will schedule a free 15 minutes introductory session. We will move on from there. So for today's, it's all, and you have a great day.